Thank you for having us today. This is an experimental challenge for us to have a lecture through the video. We are neither professors nor experts in the field of international relations in East Asia. However, as a person who studied in Japan, China, and South Korea through the Campus Asia program, it is a great honor to share our experience today. We hope you can learn something from this lecture. This lecture will have three parts, and I'll be in charge of the first part. My name is Ten Yokose, a graduate student from University of Tokyo. In the first part, I will talk about the importance of Japan, China, and South Korea relations in globalization and raising Asia, including historical issue we have. Firstly, let me show you the promotion video of our Campus Asia program. Today, we are living in an age of unforeseen changes. COVID-19 has completely changed our way of life, and we have never felt more eager to have a sense of mutual connection. However, a rapid decline in face-to-face -face interactions has placed formidable barriers for international cooperation, posing the idea of deglobalization as something increasingly tangible. It seems that an invisible fear towards the virus has even had the effect of amplifying division within each nation. As people become increasingly preoccupied with day-to-day -day survival, kindness and benevolence for each other seems harder to find. Under these circumstances, Japan, China, and South Korea, the rising centers of the global economy, have been struggling with many regional issues, coexisting with mutual animosity and bitterness. Imagine having the fear of being sneered as a foreigner even if you were born in that country. This sort of exclusionary rhetoric isn't fiction in Northeast Asia. People around you may suddenly scream at you and say, get out and go home. In fact, statistics show that positive feelings between these three countries are at the lowest level ever recorded. However, the greatest value that we create comes from cooperation. While international trade and cooperation is considered to be a contributing factor to the rapid spread of the disease, it is undeniable that this has also been a driver of growth and prosperity. East Asia is not an exception to this rule. There is no room for doubt that Japan, China, and South Korea have taken leading roles in a growing East Asia and will continue to do so. If anything, we're not just talking about economic growth. Take the spreading influence of East Asian pop culture, for instance. K-pop became a global phenomenon and took first place in the Billboard rankings. Japanese animation, Mandopop and Cantopop are now one of their main exports to other countries. In light of these challenges and developments, the Campus Asia program was established to promote cooperation amongst universities in Japan, China, and South Korea in creating a human resource platform. Starting from one pilot program in 2011, Campus Asia has now expanded to 17 programs with disciplines varying from business MBA programs to medical programs. Amongst these, the Besito Campus Asia program consisting of the University of Tokyo, Peking University, and Seoul National University has taken a leading role. These universities are recognized as a top university within each nation for its history and academic status. It is also interesting that each school in the program offers different academic disciplines. Students can learn public policy at the University of Tokyo, international relations at Peking University, and various international studies at Seoul National Universities. Furthermore, students can gain an exceptional experience in a campus rich in history. Hey Tenu, is it okay if we just ask you a few questions about the program? Okay, so how would you describe your experience from the Campus Asia program? Thanks to the Campus Asia program, I could study in the top level universities in Japan, China, and Korea. Besides international relations, I could also study international organization, business, and languages. 
through these classes in different fields, I could realize three countries' position and roles in the international, governmental, and civil society level. Besides class, we go on field trips every semester, and we live in the same dormitory. Through daily interaction and field trips, we are able to have a wide range of discussions. I came to understand diverse points of view towards pertinent global and East Asian issues. Okay, so one last question. How do you think you've changed the most through the program? Due to my background living in China when I was young, I struggled with my identity as a representative of Japan in discussing global issues. However, in the Campus Asia program, we all have various backgrounds and some people have similar experience as me. Through the conversation, I realized I do not have to decide or only have one identity. I could have different identities depending on the situation. Now, my identity is a part of the Campus Asia family. When I talk about the Campus Asia program, I always describe Campus Asia as a family. It is because we live, eat, travel, share worthiness and happiness, and always help each other. Friendships made through the program extend beyond graduation. The Basido Campus Asia program places a large emphasis on alumni activities since alumni are encouraged to make real changes through the utilization of their experiences and networks in these three countries. Campus Asia alumni have also held workshops in cooperation with TCS in 2018 and 2019. Not only did we enjoy the reunion, we were also able to discuss how to make an impact in the region together as part of the Campus Asia family. Under these circumstances affected by COVID-19, program alumni also hosted a webinar to discuss the lessons that were learned through this pandemic. What kind of experience from Campus Asia would you say was valuable to your current job? And Campus Asia was a great chance to try a new field and find out what I actually wanted to focus in terms of subject of study and also career path. For me, being a Chinese area student major, I was able to try other than my major when I came to grasp. And it let me try out an internship in a bank. And now I'm pursuing a career that I never thought that I would do before Campus Asia. And most importantly, without the support from the people I met during the Campus Asia, I wouldn't have been able to try to find a job in Japan. And more than two years of experience in Korea, Japan, and China, it enhanced our academic knowledge. But the most valuable experience was creating a relationship with people who can share the same identity as Campus Asia. And I believe the companionship and shared experience are not only valuable for the current job, but it will continue to grow as we work in various fields across the world. The network of alumni has seen constant expansion, with each of them using their experiences and working in these three countries. The Basido Campus Asia program will not cease its journey even under this era of uncertainty. In response to the situation with COVID-19, each university has provided full support in order to continue student exchange both online and offline. And as a matter of fact, this video was also made during the pandemic. Regarding the creation of a society that can truly overcome the past and bring forth a brighter future, there still remains a long way to go for Japan, China, and South Korea. Besido Campus Asia will continue in its pursuit of the creation of the best program for further regional cooperation in East Asia. We invite you to become part of it. Campus Asia. 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 How was the video? As you could see from the video, the Campus Asia program makes the best effort to be a platform to foster the best talent who will lead East Asia. As the video shows, we need to cooperate to be productive. 
The assumption to cooperate is we trust each other. Otherwise, cooperation will not be easy to realize. However, when we look at the three countries' statistics, we can see that we lack trust and affinity. Let's take a look at the statistics of the three countries. According to the Cabinet Office Public Opinion Poll on Foreign Affairs in 2019, when asked whether they saw the future development of Japan's relations with China and South Korea is important for both countries and the Asia-Pacific region, 75.1% of Japanese people responded they thought it is important for China, while 57.5% for South Korea. However, on the other hand, when asked if they felt the affinity to China, 74.9% of respondents said they do not feel the affinity to China, and 71.5% said to South Korea. What is the perception of South Korea and China towards Japan? According to the survey conducted by the Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat, about 30 to 40% of South Korea citizens and Chinese people answered that they feel familiarity with Japan. And when asked whether they trust Japan, about 30% of South Korea citizens and nearly half of Chinese people answered yes. To conclude, even though people think the relationship among East Asian countries are important, we still lack trust and affinity with each other. What is the origin of this antipathy to the other two countries? The historical background had a considerable influence. Especially World War II had a significant impact on the three countries' relations. Let's have a look at bilateral relations. Regarding Japan-China relations, Japan occupied Manchuria in northern China in 1931, and the Second Sino-Japanese War broke out in 1937. The Second World War broke out at a time when the Sino-Japanese War had become protracted. Millions of Chinese died before Japan surrendered in 1945. Following Japan's defeat in the Pacific War, the Sino-Japanese War ended in August 1945. In the Treaty of San Francisco in 1952, Japan restarted diplomatic relations with the government of the Republic of China, while no diplomatic ties with the government of the People's Republic of China. This state of affairs continued until the normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and China in 1972. Historical issues and territorial disputes have also influenced Japan-China relations. For example, the Nanjing massacre and the Prime Minister's visit to the Yasukuni Shrine have provoked an outcry from many Chinese people. Since Junichiro Koizumi became Prime Minister in 2001, relations with China have deteriorated due to Koizumi's visits to the Yasukuni Shrine. This led to a rise in anti-Japanese sentiment and protests against Koizumi in China. From this background, anti-Japanese sentiment grew stronger. And in 2005, large-scale anti-Japanese demonstrations broke out in China. In 2012, Japan's action toward the Senkaku Islands resulted in the largest demonstration of anti-Japanese activity in China. Different perceptions have influenced the public's view of Sino-Japanese relations. Regarding Japan-South Korea relations, Japan and South Korea have maintained peaceful relationships as good neighbors throughout long history. However, from the annexation of Korea 
In August 1910, Japan ruled Korea as a colony for 35 years. Japan's defeat in World War II brought the end to colonize Korea Peninsula in 1945. It should have been an opportunity to rebuild Korea as a single sovereign nation and a new starting point to restore the traditional good neighborly relations between Japan and Korea. However, the reality was different. Although Korea had been liberated as a Japanese colony, the complicated international situation before and after World War II led to the country divided into two. The conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union happened in the Korean Peninsula in 1950. It became an ethnically divided nation. In June 1965, the Treaty on Basic Relations between Japan and the Republic of Korea was signed under Sato Eisaku and Park Chung-hee. With this, Japan recognized South Korea as the only legitimate government on the Korean Peninsula and established diplomatic relations with South Korea. Japan has also pledged to provide economic support such as $300 million as grant aid and $200 million as loan. The Park Administration achieved rapid economic growth of over 10% from the mid-1960s onwards with Japanese funds and aid from the US and Europe. It was known as a miracle on the Hung River. As democratization has progress in South Korea, some historical issues have appeared. Since the 1990s, the comfort women issue has been raised in South Korea. The Japanese government has responded by announcing the Kono Statement and cooperating with the Asian Women's Fund. Kono Statement clarified the facts about comfort women and apologized to South Korea for the first time. In the Murayama statement, he apologized for Japan's colonial rule and aggression. In August 2012, South Korea President Lee Myung-bak landed on Takeshima because of dissatisfaction with Japan's attitude towards comfort women issue. After this, Relations between Japan and South Korea deteriorated rapidly. In December 2013, Prime Minister Abe's visit to the Yasukuni Shrine led to an extreme deterioration in Japan-South Korea relations. The Korean War, which broke out on 25th June 1950, had far-reaching consequences not only for the newly formed Chinese Communist Party, but also for the whole of East Asia. During the Korean War, the confrontation began with North Korea moving south. The U.S. supported to the south, and the Chinese military entered the war by supporting the north. As the American troops moved north across the 38th parallel, the People's Republic of China's government decided to help North Korea and sent many Chinese People's Volunteer Army. With Chinese troops' entry into the war, the American forces retreated south of the 38th parallel and abandoned Seoul in 1953. Despite the full support of South Korea by the American military, the People's Republic of China fought more than evenly to support North Korea after its establishment. This fact astonished the world and strengthened Mao Zedong's leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, both domestically and internationally. On 23rd August 1992, 
China and South Korea signed a joint statement on establishing diplomatic relations. Until then, China and South Korea had severed ties for more than 40 years after the Korean War. Since then, China and South Korea have maintained close diplomatic and economic relations. On the other hand, China was the biggest supporter and collaborator for North Korea. However, China kept North Korea's nuclear development in check. South Korea has asked the U.S. to deploy SAD to deal with North Korean missiles. But China is opposed to deploying SAD. There are a lot of issues among the three countries. So, what is the point of these three countries cooperating? Firstly, we have the power to influence the world. We are not small countries in the Far East anymore. According to the GDP ranking from the World Bank, China ranks the second, Japan is the third, and South Korea is the twelfth globally. The total GDP of three countries occupies about one-fourth of the world total GDP. The three countries need to cooperate more actively than ever before to develop East Asia and the world economy. Secondly, we are mutually dependent, especially in trade. The three countries have a significant impact on the world economy. The interdependence among China, Japan, and South Korea through trade and investment is also increasing. Each of the three countries has become an important trading partner, with the share of imports from the other two countries accounting for more than 20% of their own imports. The three countries' economic partnership is an important point at the core of East Asian economic integration, and various trilateral initiatives have been undertaken. Thirdly, we are too big to fail and to wage war. The Cold War system remains in our region. Soft landing in North Korea is one focal point. Instead of increasing tensions, we need to cooperate. Until so far, three countries have been making efforts to create peaceful relations. Since 2008, the Trilateral Summit has been held once a year to strengthen trilateral cooperation. In addition to economic cooperation, the three countries decided to cooperate on common issues such as environmental problems and the aging society. At the second trilateral summit meeting in 2009, the three countries agreed to establish the Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat, so-called TCS, to promote peace and prosperity. Since educational exchange will also be the foundation of future relations, the Campus Asia program launched to conduct the high-quality inter-university exchange. The next video will explain the Campus Asia program, participants' personal stories, and some key statistics of the programs.